Greetings everyone, I'm Historical Method Man, and this is my original capstone research, animatronics, theme parks, and race, representations of non-white and non-Western bodies in imagineered spaces. New debates over cultural representations in theme parks have continued in the 20th century, for the first time sparking action from entertainment corporations to revise and refurbish socially outdated segments of their attractions. At its American Parks in 2022, Disney altered the Jungle Cruise to make their parks more inclusive, removing the egregious animatronics of Trader Sam, the head salesman of the jungle, and diversifying their cast of animatronics. A statement provided by Disney on the attraction's revision reported their intentions. Imagineers are addressing negative depictions of native peoples while adding a humorous storyline that follows the adventure of a Jungle Cruise skipper. Guests will also find this group of adventurers to be diverse in background and fields of interest. Audiences, customers, are noticing unfair racial representations, and theme parks are beginning to respond. Similar refurbishments removed scenes that depicted sex trafficking in Pirates of the Caribbean. These attraction refurbishments were the inspiration for this research. The first aim of this project is to highlight cross-cultural depictions, perceptions, and receptions in the themed entertainment industry as a continuity from the existing historiography on World's Fairs. Second, this project extends the bodily implications of wax figure technology and cultural exhibits into the second half of the 20th century with the invention of animatronics. Third, this project establishes these two elements, audio animatronics and their themed environments, as the rich primary sources that represent a greater modern consumer culture. Finally, this video investigates depictions of the other in 20th century theme parks and amusement parks. I argue that themed entertainment corporations attempted to approximate bodies through animatronic technology. However, the dehumanization of Western representations of non-white and non-Western bodies persists as a continuity from the public world's fair tradition into the private theme park industry. Because of the complex nature of weaving together multiple histories, this video will be organized in multiple parts. First and second are the historiography and methods whereby I further establish that theme park attractions and other park elements are rich, useful, and accessible primary sources. The third section investigates the changing contexts of wax and animatronic exhibitions, from diplomatic world's fairs to corporate theme parks. The fourth part is a history of wax figures that extends into the second half of the 20th century with animatronics. What follows are four case studies that apply this method in order to understand how this imagination and forming industry constructs and reflects racial representation for Western construction. The History of the Historical Interpretation This video intersects multiple histories on multiple subjects including theme parks, world's fairs, wax figures, robotics, and the body. These subjects are worth studying together because these elements are inextricably linked to understanding late 20th century visual culture. The study of theme parks is mainly relegated to the field of American studies, and historians little analyze theme parks in international contexts. This video adds some European attractions as primary sources to add to the conversation, but it focuses exclusively on Western theme parks. After all, almost all World's Fairs were hosted by Western nations, notably until Osaka Expo 70 in Japan, the first World's Fair in Asia. There is some research on Japanese theme parks, but not much else about parks in the non-West. Within the West, the study of the American theme park is a recent development across the disciplines, but historians infrequently research them. In the 2000s, Dr. Margaret J. King wrote some of the premier analysis on theme parks as products of American culture. She defined the theme park as a social artwork designed as a four-dimensional symbolic landscape, evoking impressions of places and times, real and imaginary. Theme parks differ from amusement parks in that they rely on themed environments rather than solely providing amusement. Theme parks are immersive places of experience, whereas with amusement parks, thrills are relatively cheap. Theming is the art of evoking instant moods. For instance, dark rides move throughout a course of vignettes, positioning guests and directing their attention to symbols, physical sensations, and stories. Themed environments and attractions are unique mediums because they activate all the senses. Overall, I agree with King's assertion that the theme park should be considered as prominent, even central, American cultural icons, not only because they are popular forms, but because they offer an index to culture in themselves. 
theme parks should be considered among the most significant social artworks of the 20th century. Theme parks are rich four-dimensional primary sources that have massive impacts on the public and cultural consciousness. The most comprehensive study that linked theme parks to the World's Fair tradition was conducted by Steve Nelson on Epcot, which opened its gates four years prior to his 1986 article. Nelson draws an important through line between the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago with Epcot itself. The division of Epcot into two themed lands, Future World and World Showcase, directly aligns with the division of the 1893 World's Fair into the White City and the Midway. Chicago's White City was a monumental and idealized vision of the future, where manufactured items took center stage. Much like Epcot, Mechanized presentations and colossal displays fascinated and entertained, all while selling a product. In Epcot, Test Track is sponsored by Chevrolet, Kodak sponsored the Imagination Pavilion, and Siemens sponsored Spaceship Earth. This is a continuity from the 1964 World's Fair, wherein Ford sponsored the Magic Skyway, General Electric sponsored the Carousel of Progress, and Pepsi sponsored It's a Small World. As for the Midway and World Showcase, this paper draws more from Steve Nelson on Epcot in the section linking the 1893 streets of Cairo with attractions that simulate the Middle East and the so-called Orient. I disagree with Nelson in that each country's MIDI pavilion is worth studying. Nelson claimed that discussing the specific features of each mini country is pointless, since all are cosmetic overlays of the same theme. The world's cultural diversity can be reduced to variations in costume, language, and diet. This argument is uncharitable because each and every pavilion at Epcot has specific elements with significances worth uncovering. Nelson was still correct in his assertion that each pavilion in Epcot is more representative of Americanness than foreignness, as they are filled with Coca-Cola, t-shirts, and souvenirs. Randall Shepard's analysis of Epcot's Mexico pavilion disagrees with Nelson's method, not by questioning authenticity for tourist attractions, but instead looking at how nations defined their authentic version of tourism that is later brought to Western audiences through theme parks. Attractions based on real-life spaces must pass the tourist test of recognizable authenticity. According to one of Shepard's interviewed sources who worked on the Mexico Pavilion, it was very difficult to convey that guests coming to the park want to see preconceived ideas of the world as opposed to factual realities. Shepard's method understands that the country's own authentic definition of tourism informs the simulation's version of authentic. Dr. Jamie Constock Skip identified a major blind spot in studies that link World's Fairs to theme parks, in which scholars tend to ignore specific park features and or do not use attractions as exemplary primary sources. Comstock Skip focused her analysis on one attraction, Indiana Jones Adventure at Disneyland to make a greater argument about temples as pavilions. This inquiry is informed by this exact blind spot in the historiography, centering attractions and park elements as the key primary sources. While this paper does not limit itself to probing about one attraction, it specifically pins down audio animatronics as theme park elements worth studying. The project most closely aligned with this one is definitely Malia Holmes' Simulated Imperialism, Home draws from Beauregard to acknowledge theme parks as works of simulacra and the hyper-real. She looks inquisitively into the 1964 Disney classic attraction, It's a Small World, which debuted at the 1964 World's Fair, sponsored by Pepsi. Home defines the three interlocking operations of simulated imperialism as the signification of imperial processes generated by simulacra, the amplification of colonizing projects through simulation, and the interpolation of hybrid subjects articulated between immobility and inanimation. Holm notes the limited movements of the colonized subjects, the non-Western dolls within It's a Small World. Each continent is relegated to its own room where the dolls sing in each language, a cacophony. However, in the final scene, all the dolls are dressed in white, singing in English and dancing together. Quite literally, the finale whitewashes. Disney represented the simulated colonized subjects as children, continuing the colonial pattern of commodity racism. Holm importantly notes that we, the guests, are subjects ourselves. This fact informs much of the study. Fixed into mechanized boats, immobile, they, the guests, become obedient cogs, 
within the infrastructure of a greater simulated imperialist superstructure, Disney's empire. Because of home, I acknowledge how themed entertainment corporations surveil guests on the attractions, ordering them to keep their hands and feet inside the boat at all times. We cannot be full subjects without mobility, so home reminds us that the attraction systems are the subjects worth studying. This project on theme parks is also one that extends the history of wax figures into the latter half of the 20th century. Both ethnographic wax figures and animatronics were key elements throughout the history of World's Fairs. So, there was already scholarship on the exhibition of the other, through uncanny forms like wax figures and mannequins. In 2016, Professor of German Dana A. Weber argued that wax figures deeply intertwines the fields of visual arts, physical anthropology, and ethnology in Germany and elsewhere during the 20th century. Weber outlines a dichotomy between the uncanniness innate to a body with no life and vivification of these figures becoming more lifelike. By displaying cultural artifacts in a depersonalized manner, the wax figure invites an objectifying, oftentimes colonial, and leveling perspective in contemplation. This video aligns with and spiritually continues Weber's approach selecting animatronics as the next logical iteration of bodily simulation. Weber, however, did not take this approach. She instead investigated digital bodies made with three-dimensional computer-generated digital animation. It makes much more sense to subsequently study the audio animatronic because they move vivaciously, but they often are depersonalized figures. Methods and Purpose one of the leading goals of this research project is to further establish theme parks, theme park attractions, and themed lands as useful primary sources for understanding material culture, and in this case, myths of other places and peoples. According to Richard Francoviglia and his essay on the significance of imagineered historical places, theme parks interpret the design of historic landscapes they supposedly recreate. Although, Theme parks are first and foremost a business that profits from attendance, and companies generate and grow attendance by investing in new attractions. These new attractions are both a window and a mirror that shines light on and reflects society's symbols. They conversely manufacture new symbols to reflect society's demands and desires in the name of profit. Sourcing was a major challenge for this research project, but the power of the internet proved useful for guests have been documenting their local theme parks through fan blogs and creating their own digital archives. Photographs are key primary sources, as visitors constantly take pictures to remember their vacations with their friends and family. The private nature of these themed entertainment corporations makes it difficult to access their archives. Similarly, it is difficult to consult those who created these attractions and pavilions due to deaths, continuing relationships with theme park companies, or personal reasons. I sadly do not have access to the Walt Disney Company's digital archives, but it is not impossible for independent researchers to gain access, pending approval. This approval seems rare, even for professional academics. Cooperations with these companies remains difficult. Luckily, theme park fans have been documenting these vacation destinations and compiling them into digital archives dedicated to each local amusement. One fan, Werner Weiss, curates Yesterland a blog centered around Disneyland and Walt Disney World's past attractions. Even less prominent theme parks have their own fan history websites, Great Adventure History, which seeks to celebrate the history of the world's largest seasonal theme park. This digital archive is especially impressive, compiling together press releases, souvenirs, and countless photographs of individual attractions, backstage areas, and even restrooms. The accessibility of digitized primary sources benefits all inquiries into theme parks' cultural, economic, and social significance. To overcome these databases' lack of professionalization, I scrutinized point-of-view POV videos of attractions on YouTube to confirm informal written descriptions of attractions' show scenes. While the digital primary source collection is unique, I subjected them to traditional historical analysis of close reading and interpretation. The sources and descriptions are new, but the analysis is traditional, using applied, established historical theories discussed later in the video. This video uses theme park attractions as primary sources to investigate construction of racial differences. This is one of the countless ways that theme park attractions, as material culture and a storytelling medium, can be useful tools for historical inquiry. Furthermore, this project pays special attention to audio-animatronic reproductions of the human body. 
Using the animatronics in bodily histories can unlock new understandings of race, gender, disability, beauty, masculinity, age, and the fat body. The animatronic opens up questions about performance, labor, mechanization, and the post-anthropocene. Theme parks sit at the intersection between a multitude of gazes, much like photographs and other visual culture. I adapted Jane Collins and Catherine Lutz's The Photograph as an intersection of gazes in order to analyze the theme park. Theme park designers take the photographer's gaze. The photographer responds to what is sometimes a profound alienation from the people being photographed and may feel compelled to put the camera between themselves and whatever is remarkable that they encounter. The magazine's gaze relates to how themed entertainment corporations brand themselves in print like advertisements, maps, and press releases. The reader's gaze becomes the guest's gaze. What draws their attention and informs their behavior in a highly simulated environment? There can be explicitly Western and non-Western gazes, wherein the Westerners are always explorers, scientists, officials, or tourists. The complicating factor is that the animatronics in this study lack agency and candidness, limited by software, hardware, and their creative inputs. The biases are encoded. From World's Fairs to Theme Parks As mentioned in the historiography, private theme parks are the spiritual successors of diplomatic World's Fairs. Disneyland and Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom developed alongside the fairs, and theme park designers constructed many exhibitions at the 1964 World's Fair. Around the same time that the World's Fairs died out, arguably after the failure of the 1984 Louisiana World Exhibition, more theme parks and amusement parks popped up around the United States, Europe, and globally. The American roller coaster boom began only 10 years after the 1964 World's Fair and continued until 1980. This transition of prominence also kept attraction design and urban planning in the hands of themed entertainment corporations. Finally, and most importantly for this video, both World's Fairs and theme parks were and are sites where wax figures and animatronics reside. World's Fairs and theme parks were sites not only for animatronic performers, but they were also the site where nations and corporations used living or animatronic performers to construct their identity during rising internationalism. Jamie Comstock Skip noticed how this process played out on the ground level. International exhibitions were places to see and be seen in, allowing visitors to internalize the linear trajectory between savagery and civilization. But Disney takes this line and gives it another dimension in the name of fantasy. World's Fair pavilions were, and theme park attractions are, simulacra that blur the lines between real and fiction. The result is hyperreal. In the words of Eric Sandweiss about the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition, the Japanese pavilion became Japan. The streets of Cairo became Egypt. Both World's Fairs and theme parks simplify a complex world. World's Fairs are also entangled with theme parks because they fundamentally rely on modern urban planning practices. Disney's name is equally important to American urban history as the names of Levitt, Moses, and Olmsted. Theme parks and world fairs are planned and artificial spaces. Richard Francoviglia understood how Disney and his team employed a number of important traditional European and American planning designs, creating the hub and spoke layout of Disneyland and its reproductions. World's fairs and theme parks also enclosed guests with planned sight lines, some parks even using dirt berms. Walt Disney, among all other theme park designers, was an urban planner who understood the world's fair tradition. A major difference between World's Fairs and theme parks are their lifespans, as incidental structures made up the pavilions. The World's Fairs, unlike most theme parks, invited international participation for guest nations to build special exhibit pavilions that also housed administrative staff, revealing how growing economic interdependence came a common sense of proper behavior, a slowly cohering set of standards by which measure a people's attainment of civility. The incidental nature of World's Fairs remained a continuity, but it also meant that the fairs did not guarantee a profit. Theme parks are different from fairs because their investment is made with a 5, 10, or 20-year plan. Theme parks and World's Fairs have a deeply entangled story because they both exhibit. The 1964 New York World's Fair was an important event in the Disney Company's corporate history of its parks division, as they debuted multiple attractions that they later transplanted into their parks. Behold, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, the first attraction that utilized a humanoid audio animatronic. The Illinois Land of Lincoln Pavilion at the New York World's Fair hosted the robotic president, 
who delivered his famous Gettysburg Address. The first mechanical and animated reproduction of the human form, Mr. Lincoln performed thousands of times throughout his lifespan, before being replaced by an electric and not pneumatic version of himself. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with a great deal of pride and pleasure, I present to you Electro, the Westinghouse Moto Man. Electro, come here. And here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, walking up to greet you under his own power. Today, we are going to investigate what happens when humans create artificial bodies. Why do we do it, and what do they mean? This video is an investigation into the history of the wax figure and the animatronic, placing two distinct stories onto one timeline. If you are new to the channel, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing for more. Let's jump into it. In Walter Benjamin's landmark essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, the German philosopher argued that the value of art diminishes when it is mechanically reproduced for its aura and uniqueness disappeared. Even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. Applying Benjamin's framework to anthropomorphic puppets, wax figures, and audio animatronics reveals that these three artworks have a live aura and presence as works of art. However, as mechanical reproductions of human bodies, these figures lack the unique aura of human life and capacity for experience. Since the dawn of the wax figure, humans have attempted to better approximate bodies to cross beyond the uncanny valley. These figures are not reproductions of art as Benjamin described. Instead, they are mechanical reproductions of the human body. People have continued to approximate human movement to make these artificial bodies believable through pneumatic or electronic animation. Because the histories of anthropomorphic wax figures and lifelike animatronics remain separate from each other, the first portion of this thesis draws a continuity from wax figures to animatronics in these two separate histories of technology. These mechanical reproductions of the human body were also labor-saving devices, lessening the need for live performers. This history of animatronics is a unique history of wax figures. How were wax figures even made? The process of making realistic wax figures has little changed over the centuries. The sculptors from a 2021 How It's Made segment used the same process described in an 1889 Scientific American abstract on producing wax celebrity figures. First, the sculptors create or hire a model to mold with plaster. In the best case scenario, their subject is living, willing, and able to be measured precisely. Both 1889's and 2021's processes used photographs of the subject to map their face in three dimensions. The case of using clay to create a hollow plastic mold for wax is simple, but the same is not true for the case of the live model. The sculptor places a toothpick between the model's teeth so that they can breathe while being encased in plaster over an inch in thickness. The sculptor removes the mold from the clay or person, pours in melted beeswax to create a hollow shell, removes the excess liquid wax after a shell hardens, and then removes the plaster mold entirely. The sculptor works wax magic to texture and paint the wax human. The eyes are crafted extremely carefully with painted pupils and irises, and simple red strands are used for the blood vessels. Strands of hair are individually set into the wax, melted precisely. These same eye-popping and hair-pulling processes are used with animatronics. This wax process dates back to the ancient Mediterranean, but early modern Europe saw a takeoff for wax as a literary device, art form, and scientific tool. English dramatist John Webster used wax figures as a plot device in 1613's The Duchess of Malfi. The titular duchess is tricked at the sight of wax figures into thinking her family was dead. 
This use of wax effigies in literary plot demonstrates English familiarity with wax figures in the 17th century. Wax sculptures commonly made death masks and effigies. They also acted as molds for bronze casting. Wax figures became body doubles for researchers and students of anatomy during the 18th century. Wax figures were variably useful in arts, sciences, and culture. The same must be said for audio animatronics and the animation of wax figures. While not made of wax, these robots similarly embody their subject. There is an extensive early modern history of robotic performers as art. Clockworkers crafted early automata in the 14th century at European cathedrals. Two centuries later, in 1509, Leonardo da Vinci designed and constructed a mechanical lion that could walk. The Jacques Droz family were famous watchmakers and automata craftspeople in the late 18th century France. They created three figures, the musician, the draughtsman, and the scribe. The scribe was capable of inking a quill tip and writing a reprogrammable message up to 40 characters long on a sheet of paper. The scribe famously invoked Descartes, writing, I think, therefore, I am. The Jacques Droz family was able to give motion and animation to a thoughtless figure, another step in humanizing wax figures. Not all artificial performers were made to be human. Instead, the robots came. In the 20th century, Westinghouse Electric Corporation's Electro, the Moto Man, and his dog Sparky were two of the most popular early animatronic performers. They put on regular performances at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. Electro responded to voice commands through a telephone, cracked jokes, lit up, and even smoked cigarettes. Electro's movements were incredibly simple by today's standards, but he nevertheless captivated audiences as an engaging and entertaining performer. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. The English word robot is derived from the Czech word robato, translated as serf, slave, or forced to labor. Karl Čapek in 1921 popularized the word robot in his play R.U.R., or Rossum's Universal Robots. The play about robots replacing humans was an allegory of the Bolshevik revolutions in 1917. The robots represented the masses of workers as they revolted against their creators. While also a symbol, robots fundamentally are labor-saving devices. Their job is to labor. In the case of theme park animatronics, their job is to perform and entertain. Unlike workers, it remains unlikely for robots to revolt and strike for better working conditions. Robots, the mechanical slave, are mechanical reproducers of human labor. Robotic performers and animatronics replace the labor of performance, able to replicate precise motion for thousands of shows in a row. The Walt Disney Company became incredibly interested in robotic animation technology following Disneyland's debut in 1955. After redefining two-dimensional animation, Disney's major goal with developing animatronic technology was to invent a three-dimensional form of animation. According to the corporate history of the Walt Disney Company, their first attempt at robotic theater included an automaton model of American actor Buddy Ebsen. Engineers developed this miniature mechanical dancing man in the 1950s, programmed by paper that resembles an automatic piano roll. The Walt Disney Company and Walt Disney himself put this animated figure on hiatus because of the overly complex electronics that predated computers and transistors. The mechanics of this miniature automaton were comparatively massive, and engineers abandoned this project due to its complexity. The Buddy Ebsen Dancing Man, while not entirely successful, mechanically reproduced the human action of dancing. Animatronics became more fluid and lifelike with every technological development over time, getting closer to humanization. 1964 was the most important year for animatronics in the public eye because the World's Fair in New York City featured multiple iconic attractions created by WED Enterprises. As Talking Birds debuted at Disneyland's Enchanted Tiki Room on the West Coast, Great moments with Mr. Lincoln, It's a Small World, The Carousel of Progress, and Ford's Magic Skyway debuted for East Coast and international audiences. 
The technological developments that executed the shows at the 1964 New York World's Fair were rapid and made public all at once. The most important technological developments in this era was in programming. Disney's proprietary show control unit, the Digital Animation Control System, allowed for motion tracking from a harness that an actor and programmer would wear. As a 1976 reviewer of Disney's America Sings Attraction noted, such an approach of acting is entirely synthetic and a performance is constructed instant by instant rather than responding to an actor's internal impulses. Later on, control boards began to more precisely control animatronic movements, replacing hand grips with individual finger controls. The anthropomorphic audio animatronic is not just a mechanical reproduction of the human body, but it also mechanically reproduces human motion and animation. In attempting to approximate the human body, recreating human skin was a major obstacle. Materials engineers at the Walt Disney Company, and by extension, other animatronic manufacturing firms, had to overcome the great challenge of replicating human skin that was both functional and believable. Vinyl skin envelops a fiberglass skeleton, taking on stage makeup so audience members at any distance can read the figure's features. Latex substances began to replace vinyl because the material has memory and elasticity. Disney research scientists at the 1996 American Chemical Society meeting in Orlando discussed the difficulties of creating and maintaining these polymers. Any material, no matter how tough, is bound to fail after many repetitions of a movement. Therefore, the polymer must also be easier to repair. The real cost isn't the injection or the molding process. It's in the labor required after the figure has been cast. Durability and flexibility are paramount for keeping a robotic performer of any species alive. Engineers do not want mechanical pirates and Abraham Lincoln to crack at the lips and tear at the skin. So, these animatronics require a large amount of upkeep. Unlike the human body, the animatronic body cannot heal itself. Rather, it is up to the engineers to take care of animatronics through malfunctions that destroyed believability and crawled deeper into the uncanny valley. In the recent past, animatronics have begun to use artificial intelligence in order to become interactive. In 2007, an American inventor named Jean P. Hamilton filed a patent for an AI that models human physical behavior and actions. This AI is trained using an input that matches the persona of a historical figure in order to both educate and entertain. The patent states, it would be even more spectacular and enlightening to be able to ask questions of Mr. Lincoln, both about his own era and his thoughts and impressions of our time and civilization. To be able to converse with President Lincoln in real time would indeed be a unique experience for anyone. Other historical figures mentioned in this patent are limited to Plato, Martin Luther, Sir Isaac Newton, Andrew Carnegie, Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, and Sir Winston Churchill. Each historical figure's AI would be programmed using various overlapping brain parameters that match human characteristics and behavioral patterns. Before AI, engineers humanized robots by giving them precise commands and exact electrical inputs. In the future, these robots will be humanized not only by their movements and behaviors, but also their decisions to behave the way they choose. In conclusion, the creation of artificial bodies, whether in the form of wax figures or animatronics, represents a fascinating intersection of art, science, and technology. These lifelike replicas have a live aura and presence as works of art, but they lack the unique aura of human life and the capacity for experience. Today, we will be looking at how Africa is depicted in Western theme parks. So, if you would be so kind to like, comment, and subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. Let's jump in. Representations of Africa in American and European theme parks reveal a continuity from the colonial era, where white corporations and businesses continue to exoticize the so-called dark continent for their audiences. Before exploring specific attractions, themed lands, and theme parks, it is important to first understand the concept of Africa in the Western imagination. Dr. Curtis A. Keem's monograph, Mistaking Africa, Curiosities and Inventions of the American Mind, 
provides a framework to understand depictions of Africa in American theme parks. Dr. Keem asked his students to create a list of words that come to mind when thinking about Africa. His students came up with traditional words, native, savage, hut, tribe, and cannibals. Tourism words, safari, pyramid, wild animals. News words, poverty, ignorance, tragedy. Change words that indicated Western-induced change, like development, missionary, and foreign aid. And occasionally, the students came up with racist words. We learned to accept these myths from popular culture and television culture, cartoons, news, nature documentaries, ethnography documentaries on the learning channels, and in this case, themed entertainment parks. Theme parks make Africa seem excitingly different and exotic within Western imaginations. Comparing Six Flags Great Adventure and Wild Safari, Bush Gardens, The Dark Continent, and Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park reveals a through line in a greater landscape of safari theme parks. As Curtis A. Keem noted, these parks respond to demand. Quote, We prefer rural ethnography and find nature more interesting and enlightening than daily life in urban cities where people actually reside. There are three patterns that are recognizable and consistent when it comes to depicting Africa in these theme parks. First, there is the tendency to manufacture nature on demand through animal exhibits that conceal many natural aspects of wildlife while also presenting themselves as natural environments. Second, these parks tend to exhibit Africa as either a homogeneous entity and sometimes a group of spaces without giving context to adequately represent the peoples and cultures they imagine. Third, these parks cement Africa in Western imaginations as an exotic land that is excitingly different. The first attraction that we will look at is Six Flags Great Adventure's indoor roller coaster, Skull Mountain. Opened in 1996, Skull Mountain has a dark atmosphere of foreboding that sent a message to theme park guests that they were entering a dangerous place. During the early years of the attraction, 1996 to 1998, Skull Mountain had a detailed queue, rare for a Six Flags amusement park, that depicted a non-specific African village. A 1996 press release set the stage for visitors embarking to explore Skull Mountain. The visual story unfolds as guests enter the jungle pathway which leads to Skull Mountain's entrance. Guests take on the role of explorers attempting to discover the secret of the mountain's origin. As they wind through an elaborate path surrounded by lush, tropical vegetation, visitors encounter signs of previously failed expeditions, including overturned jeeps, abandoned campsites, and the remains of previous explorers. Spears, shields, and totems with African-like insignias surrounded the abandoned dig site of the story's archaeologist. The huts were small and thatched. Interesting to note were the large cauldrons in the queue, large enough to fit a human. With the way it was positioned, no one could see what's inside, so guests were led to imagine that previous explorers had become the cannibal natives' lunch. As for the ride itself, it remains not much more than a lightly themed roller coaster in a metal box. Between the first and second tire-driven lift hills, riders on expedition trains passed by the human skeleton of an explorer who wore a colonial pith helmet and hat and between him and the wall was a native shield. In the context of the attraction story, they were about to suffer the same fate as this western explorer who encountered the natives of Skull Mountain. These theming elements reinforce American imaginations that heralded Africa as a primitive and backward space from the colonial past, never allowed to exist in the present. The exoticism present in Skull Mountain, and by extension other similarly themed attractions, portrays Africa as excitingly different. Usually this is at the expense of African culture and an extraordinary person of which is removed from its everyday context in a way that allows us to believe that the wider culture itself is wholly extraordinary. Attractions like Skull Mountain misrepresent and mistake Africa because they present the continent as mysterious, mystifying, and completely other. Similar exoticizing depictions of Africa laid in the same Adventure Rivers section of Six Flags Great Adventure. 
This 1991 parkland included slide towers lightly themed to North American, Asian, and African rivers. A sign positioned near the entrance of the African slides encouraged guests to discover the dark continent and explore its mighty rivers. The headliner attraction was a 12-person white water rapids ride, the first of its kind. Six Flags changed the 1981 Roaring Rapids attraction name to the Congo Rapids when the Adventure Rivers area of the park opened, explicitly altering the theming to be consistent with American imaginations of Africa. On the current attraction listing, Six Flags encourages Congo Rapids riders to get ready to get wet, gear up for the ultimate whitewater river rafting experience on this exotic and exciting float through the dense jungle. To be clear, there is nothing exotic about the ride itself, only insofar as the park associates the name and theming to Africa. More notably, the operators at the Roaring Rapids slash Congo Rapids were the only crew members with a specialized uniform, safari-style shirts, khaki shorts, and pith helmets to block out the sun. This dress harkened back to a historical period of imperialism, as the safari expedition uniform consistently appears in both the Congo Rapids and Skull Mountain. Because Six Flags Great Adventure is a large but typical regional chain amusement park, this theming and visual language extends to countless other American and European theme parks. Rides across the Atlantic also use this visual language to differentiate between the civilized and the savage. Monsieur Cannibal at De Efteling Theme Park in the Katsuval, Netherlands, debuted in 1988. This teacup-style flat ride perpetuated the same cannibal stereotypes about non-Western peoples through its marquee figure. The figure had no animation, and it was totally other and inhuman. This Monsieur Cannibal was half devil and half child, as Rudyard Kipling described in The White Man's Burden. Monsieur Cannibal is holding a white Tarzan child, and it cannot learn how to properly use a spoon for the ice cream it eats seemingly drunkenly. It wears the spoon as a piercing. I use the word it intentionally to demonstrate that Efteling designed this character to be readably non-human. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. Another safari amusement park themed to Africa Bush Gardens Tampa used to go by the name of Bush Gardens The Dark Continent. The Dark Continent theme park exoticized the continent of Africa by failing to provide context to the peoples, nations, and cultures it claimed to fairly represent. According to Curtis A. Keene, exoticism portrays only a portion of a culture and allows the imagination to use stereotypes to fill in the missing pieces. So, we extrapolate that other people are more different from us than they are similar. With the name The Dark Continent, the Anheuser-Busch Company presented Africa as an unknowable and mysterious place, sustaining Western myths about Africa. Curtis A. Keene, when writing, was aware of theme park's ability to captivate the imagination and make Africa, again, excitingly different. Keene analyzed a 1970s poster that advertised the park. The poster depicted a white family in an African environment, the husband and a safari suit and pith helmet, holding a chimpanzee and pointing to some off-poster site, with his wife looking on passively. His children are also following in his gaze. From the back of the elephant, an Arab or Swahili guide in flowing robes looks on, while three barely visible black African men dressed in loincloths carry the family's luggage. Bush Gardens, the Dark Continent, no longer used the poster, of which I could not find on the internet. They removed the poster due to protest. In 1996, the park rebranded itself into Bush Gardens Tampa, with a pledge and a promise to do education, conservation, and research. However, the Ubanga Banga bumper cars, which used a fake African-sounding name, in the Congo section of the park still exists. The Congo section of the park was previously named Stanleyville, after the colonial town that bore the name of the violent white conqueror of the Belgian Congo. Bush Gardens Tampa wants us to forget about its previous name and history, precisely because they knew that they generalized and mistaked Africa, still trying to cover their backs with facades of education. The Walt Disney Company attempted to avoid negative depictions of Africa and Asia with the creation of Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park in 1998. 
Regardless, the park continues to reinforce many tropes of exoticism that mistake Africa as a single homogenous space. Kilimanjaro Safari is the headliner attraction in the Africa-themed land in Animal Kingdom. Keem acknowledges how conquest nostalgia is being sold by the attraction's dilapidated colonial-era outpost. Kilimanjaro Safaris also has many scenes where nature is on demand, as story beats are triggered as the safari-themed bus traverses the course. The storyline is a hunt for poachers, of which Keem observed to model Disney's other enterprises, which from their founding in the 1950s have epitomized the Western dream of the conquest and management of nature through science and technology. The Animal Kingdom designers took a three-week safari trip to Africa, where they were planning the park and its headliner, Kilimanjaro Safari. Authenticity, either real or perceived, was the utmost goal of theming an area to Africa. Animal footprints, tire tracks, and large aggregate are all part of reproducing and simulating the African continent for Western audiences. Claiming authenticity allows audiences to mistake Africa because it distracts from the fact that it is simulacra. The goal of the theme park designer is to make you forget that the environments are simulacra, to turn the hyper-real into the real. Theme park designers across the board continue to depict Africa as a homogenous place, more important for its rural ethnography than its more urban reality. Theme parks of all budgets, from Six Flags to Efteling, use Africa as a theme because white Western audiences find it excitingly different. Exoticism plays a massive role in these post-colonial presentations of African people and places. In theme park design, the aesthetics of the colonial period prevail over the aesthetics of an independent Africa because white and Western audiences see themselves not alongside simulated Africans, but alongside the diegetic colonizers in African stories. I'm Historical Method Man, and stay tuned for another part of Animatronics, Theme Parks, and Race. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. I would greatly appreciate it. Depictions of North American Indians The same processes that relate to Africa above apply to white and western exhibitions and embodiments of American Indians, from public world's fairs to private theme parks. There has been a considerable amount of research on Walt Disney's frontier land in constructing the American West in collective memory. However, historians have seldom analyzed the attractions that portray Native Americans in detail. Moreover, historians tend to neglect exhibitions of Native Americans in themed entertainment outside of Disney theme parks. To better understand how the white gaze distorts images of Native Americans, Robert F. Burkover Jr.'s The White Man's Indian, Images of the American Indian from Columbus to Present, 1979, serves as guiding frameworks. Burkover came to similar conclusions as the other frameworks concerned with the construction of difference. First, white visual culture generalizes Native American societies and cultures into one homogenous idea. Second, the white gaze defines Native Americans through deficiencies and opposition to white ideals. Third, the white gaze describes Native Americans through highly subjective moral evaluations. Fourth, the white gaze thinks of Native Americans in the past tense, not considered in the present. Burkhofer comes to the same conclusion as Keem and Said, wherein the observer always defined the other as lacking civilization. All of these tropes not only were a continuity from world's fairs, present in multiple Disney frontier lands, but they also extend to other regional amusement parks across the United States. Previous research brought me to William Henry Jackson's photography and exhibition of Native Americans at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. White organizers excluded Native Americans from participations in the exhibit. Therefore, the inanimate nature of the North American Indian exhibit at the Centennial Exhibition peddled the idea that Native Americans were a vanished race. The exclusion of actual indigenous Americans in favor of an animatronic Native American body captured white imaginations nearly 100 years later at the 1974 World's Fair in Spokane, Washington. Native American novelist Sherman Alexie reflected on when he was eight years old and became fascinated with the animatronic Indian chief at the fair, 45 minutes from the Spokane Indian Reservation. He reminisced on how the robot invoked the soul and words of Chief Joseph, Sitting Bull, Geronimo, and Chief Seattle. They wrote, 
As the rest of my family, along with a few other representatives of our tribe, danced for tourists, I spent hours listening to that puppet chief talk. I memorized the speeches and entertained my family by reciting them word for word on our nightly drive back home to our reservation. Later in the editorial, Alexi argued that Native American people are not the primary audience of Native American museums and exhibits. Richard Frank Aviglia wrote the most comprehensive study of Walt Disney's Frontierland, for he explored Walt Disney's vision of the American West while creating Disneyland in the mid-20th century. Walt Disney was highly involved in the design and construction of the land west of the park's compass-like hub. He personally designed the river system and Tom Sawyer Island. He laid out the island to scale, with all the little inlets on the island, admonishing his designers to quit fooling around and draw it as it should be. The land acts as Walt Disney's three-dimensional mental map of the American West and Native American nations around the closing of the frontier, as marked by Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis in 1893, the decade before Disney was born. Frontierland was and is a land themed to exploration, discovery, and industry. Disneyland's designers placed attractions, shops, and exhibits themed to Native America on the westernmost periphery of the park. The now defunct attractions were the Indian Village, Indian War Canoes, and the Ceremonial Dance Show. The Indian Village was the primary attraction of Frontierland's westernmost periphery. Yesterland's description of the walkthrough that lasted until 1971 encourages guests to wander among the teepees of the Plains Indians, an Iroquois birch bark longhouse, and a cedar plank house and totem poles of the Indians of the Pacific Northwest. There's even an Indian burial ground. This ethnographic exhibit seems to be intended to educate and entertain guests using Native American art, architecture, and culture. However, the title Indian Village and Physical Design represented Native American peoples and nations as one homogenous group. To suggest greater authenticity, guests at Disneyland's Indian Village could meet a full-blooded Indian chief, and more importantly, take photographs with him. Chief Whitehorse, Truman Washington Daily, 1898 to 1996, was the last fluent speaker of the Oto Missouri language. He was a genuine actor who used Disneyland as a means to preserve, by any means necessary, knowledge about his nation. Within Indian country, there was a clear difference between the surveyor and the surveyed that reflects a greater continuity within ethnographic and colonial photography, especially in the American West. As Jane Collins and Catherine Lutz discussed in the photograph as an intersection of gazes, White's ability, position, and willingness to be the surveyor permeates the self-defining logic of constructing difference and making of the other. The gaze, in its lack of reciprocity, is distinctly colonial. The Westerners do not seek a relationship, but are content, even happy, to view the other as ethnic object. In pictures which include a Westerner, we can also potentially see ourselves being viewed by the other, and become aware of ourselves as actors in the world. In Disneyland, White guests were observers of an imagineered interpretation of Native American culture, wherein the imagineers were overwhelmingly white men with little to no lived experience of any Native American identity. The Walt Disney Company's representations of Native American peoples have improved little over time, most strongly evidenced by the Chief Joseph figure in the American Adventure. The animatronic Chief Joseph offers an argument for Native American assimilation into one country while simultaneously relegating Native American history behind the 1890 closing of the frontier. I hope that all of us might be brothers. We're the one country around us and one government for all. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. The real Chief Joseph, Imatuya Latlat, thunder traveling over the mountains, was the leader of the Ned's Percy Nation in the land now known as Idaho. The story of his nation was not one that hoped for one country around us and one government for all. His father refused to sign a treaty with Governor Isaac Stephen that demarcated land to separate whites and Native Americans in preparation for a massive settler migration westward. No man can think for me. I have no other home than this. I will not give it up to any man. Take away your paper. I will not touch it with my hand. Eight years later, the United States claimed to have legitimately bought the Nez Perce's land without any consent from the Nez Perce themselves. Robert F. Burkover Jr. argued that settler states made rhetorical and eventually substantial efforts 
to incorporate the indigenous survivors of the dispossession into their new nations. The nation is an imagined community, and theme park attractions like the American Adventure are all able to tell a story of specific nations. The Imagineers created a mechanical reproduction of Chief Joseph and made him say recorded words in support of what he and his father stood against. Both the Chief Joseph audio animatronic and Disneyland's Frontierland relegate Native Americans to a historic past that ended with Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis at the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. In these fictional lands themed to an imagined historic past, white designers did not view all Native Americans equally. Storytellers wrote the animatronic Chief Joseph to be supportive of the policy of expansion with honor. Thus, the artificial reproduction of the real Chief Joseph was a good Indian because he supported assimilation. This trend that Burkover outlined is equally relevant in Frontierland's Indian Country-themed area. The script on the Santa Fe and Disneyland Railroad in 1962 extolled good Indians and warned of bad ones. Some Indians are hostile, and across the river is proof, a settler's cabin of fire. The pioneer lies in his yard, victim of an Indian arrow. Ahead is a friendly Indian village with the inhabitants active in their daily tribal chores. Native Americans both endangered and were endangered by the westward course of so-called civilization. In Walt Disney's Frontierland, the pioneers were the heroes in a war of industry versus nature, savagery versus civilization, and assimilation versus vanishing. Depictions of indigenous North Americans in Western theme parks placed American Indian peoples and nations into an ahistorical and static past, never in the dynamic present. These depictions differentiated between good and bad American Indians, where those written to assimilate take precedence over others who wanted to live as they had. Theme park guests, generally white and of the upper classes, have a distinctly colonial relationship because they have the right to observe American Indian bodies. Theme parks put words into American Indian-themed animatronics' mouths and speak for them, often without consulting those who have a stake in indigenous issues. Now, let's move to representations of the Middle East and the so-called Orient. There remains a tendency among theme park designers to otherize people from Asia and the Middle East. Orientalist perceptions from the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago have persisted into the private theme park industry. Edward Said developed his theory of Orientalism, publishing the namesake book in 1979. Said argued that the West de develops a kind of image of the timeless Orient, as if the Orient, unlike the West, doesn't develop, it stays the same. And that's one of the problems with Orientalism, is it, is it creates a, an image outside of history of something that is placid and still and, you know, eternal, which is simply contradicted by the facts of history, you see. So that's, uh, in that, in that one sense, it's a, it's a creation of, of, you might say, an ideal other for, for Europe. At World's Fair and at theme parks, representations of the Middle East and the Greater Orient exist in uncertain times and uncertain places. I'm Historical Method Man, and this is Orientalism in the Theme Park. Please consider subscribing. Illinois urban historian Eric Sandweiss gave considerable detail about Middle Eastern representation at the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition. Throughout the fair, Western audiences found Western simulations of the Orient more authentic. Henry Ives Cobb created an East India pavilion that was praised for being, quote, better Indian than any example erected at the fair by the natives themselves, end quote. At the same time, Daniel Hudson Burnham ordered that refinement and sobriety is to be preferred to anything that is sensational and startling in appearance. Oriental designs should be avoided as such motives will naturally be employed by the Oriental nations in the erection of their own buildings. Occidental designs were supposed to show the height of civilization, and in the Orientalist sense, the Orient and non-West were everything that the West was not. In line with the civilizing mission tradition, the Western heads of the World's Columbian Exhibition believed that they alone could represent the Orient better than the Orientals themselves. 
The physical culmination of this belief was the streets in Cairo. The streets in Cairo was one of the most successful attractions at the World's Columbian Exhibition due to its exciting difference and exotic qualities. Twice daily, a parade of performers, wrestlers, musicians, clowns, and sword swallowers moved through the street on the same path a veiled new bride would make every evening. Gazers, especially male ones, also had the opportunity to observe Little Egypt doing the Hoochie Coochie belly dance. Mass American consumer audiences adored this entertainment form that packages world cultures and displays them excitingly different. An attraction most representative of the Middle East and the so-called Orient is Fata Morgana, 1981 to present, at De Efteling in Katsuval, Netherlands. Dutch attraction designer Van de Ven based this attraction on Anton Pieck's illustrations for 1001 Arabian Nights. Fata Morgana features 137 animatronics, some outsourced and others built in-house. Fata Morgana roughly translates to Mirage, and it is located in the Enderish area of the park, roughly translating to different realm. The ride takes place in a land that is explicitly other to Europe and the West. Moreover, the Arabic lettering and writing throughout this attraction is incomprehensible to Arabic speakers. Fata Morgana's use of the Arabic language is limited to transliterations, using the letters Ba, Alif, and Ra to spell out Bar. The modern standard Arabic word for bar is hijaz. This intentional misuse of language does not authentically represent the Middle East because the Arabic writing in the entire attraction by extension is gibberish. Steve Nelson on Epcot wrote, when presented as exotic entertainment, the social practices of alien cultures are tamed and reduced from the complex to the curious. This exoticization also applies to Fata Morgana, wherefore the attraction begins with a mysterious float through the jungle before encountering a wizard animatronic who commands the door into the so-called Forbidden City. Following, guests are immediately confronted with beggars in the poor quarter. The simulated slum housing is dilapidated and filled with scattered excess. In the following market scene, riders encounter a genie bottle seller, a snake charmer, and a magic carpet seller. Another animatronic in a dark alley is a screaming and gestulating figure who tries to warn us not to go any further. The rider's impressions of the Orient is one of foreboding. In the subsequent chrism scene, an Arab can be seen pointing his gun at us according to an unofficial ride synopsis. The shooting of the gun triggers a splash effect on both sides of the boat, misting riders. The prison scene also includes a major feeder of submechanophobia, with a prisoner drowning in his waterlogged cell. This prison is inhumane, the other's justice backwards. The riders are then saved by the wizard from before, and like a deus ex machina, the ride concludes with scenes of a harem, throne room, and treasury. De Efteling's Fata Morgana portrays the Middle East and Orient as ahistorical, static, and backwards. This portrayal happened because the creators of the attraction looked towards a mythical past from 1001 Arabian Nights rather than a historical interpretation of visiting a real and specific place. A more recent attraction that plays on Orientalist tropes is Akbar's Adventure Tours, 1998 an accessible motion simulator in the Egypt-themed land at Busch Gardens, Tampa. This attraction combined comedic writing, horror action, and outdated Orientalism. Akbar's Adventure Tours stars Martin Short as Akbar and Eugene Levy as Omar, where the premise is a five-minute tour of all of Egypt. In the attraction story, as told by the pre-show, Akbar is a debtor and struggling business owner getting repossessed. Both Martin Short and Eugene Levy wore brown face and spoke in Arabic accents. The attraction's racism only begins here. Akbar devises a plan by the end of the pre-show, where Omar will show his movies and the rich tourists will give us all their money. If I become rich, you become rich like them, points to the audience. The riders move into a 59-seat motion simulator with six degrees of free movement. Wind blows into guests' faces as they embark on the first scene, a camel ride through the streets of Cairo, filmed in Morocco, which explains the rocking movement of the motion base. Akbar's first scene is hectic. Men swinging swords, 
while others breathe fire and charm snakes. The first scene, tour of Egypt market on camel, connects well to the Streets of Cairo attraction at the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition because both showcased an overly crowded market bustling with exotic excitement. This digital simulation begins with two costumed men with dwarfism opening a curtain before a group of belly dancers pedal off. The audience bobs through the market until the second scene, a soaring flight near the Great Pyramids of Giza. Riders watch Omar crash into the Sphinx with the CGI destruction of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The final scene is a minecart ride to encounter a monstrous mummy, but in the end, Akbar finds treasure from an ancient tomb. I speculate that no Egyptian or Arabic language speakers were consulted on this project. The creators of Akbar's adventure tours reduced all of Egypt to an unhinged market, a crumbling tourist site, and a monstrous encounter. Over the course of a hundred years, from the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition to Busch Gardens Tampa in the 1990s, Western depictions of the Middle East and the so-called Orient have changed little because the West fundamentally misunderstands the non-West. These attractions place the Middle East and the Orient into a category ahistorical and static. These attractions place the Middle East and the Orient into a category both ahistorical and static. Conclusion In sum and substance, this video is about theme parks and the artificial bodies that inhabit them, extending previous histories of wax figures to include more recent developments in producing artificial humans. We see how humans have made great progress in the technological development of bodies without experience. Saw have you we saw how humans have made great progress in the technological development of bodies without experience. Animatronics are also useful primary sources for historical inquiry because they are simulations of the human. They take on human speech, human movement, and in the future, seemingly human and in the future, seemingly human thought processes with artificial intelligence. This video demonstrates that creators have been augmenting artificial bodies to make them more human. But dehumanizing colonial and racial processes prevent the humanizing's project. But dehumanizing colonial, but dehumanizing colonial and racial processes prevent the humanizing project's efficacy. When trying to humanize the animatronic, commodity racism makes it harder for guests to view differences with authenticity. Commodity racism makes it Commodity racism makes it harder for guests to view differences with authenticity, whatever that means, and intentions that align with the group being exhibited. In 2017, Pandora, the world of Avatar at Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park received much fanfare for its attention to detail and otherworldly scale. The land's two attractions, the Navi River Journey and Avatar Flight of Passage continue the imperial adventure genre and trope common in film and other attractions like the Jungle Cruise. Dutch psychologist and communication scholars Jap van Gennecken studied James Cameron's 2009 mega blockbuster Avatar and came to the conclusion that this movie is an imperial adventure film with a plot centered around intercultural encounters. Van Gennecken outlined five themes from the film that also apply to the attraction. First, the underpopulated virgin land. Second, of the primitive native tribe. Third, of the indigenous natural worldview. Fourth, of imperial armed intervention. And fifth, of the beautiful native girl. All of these themes should be incredibly familiar to those who know about the archetype of cowboys versus Indians. But these attractions are unique because their others are explicitly alien and inhuman. Both attractions in the land use an alien other because representing humans as other has fallen out of style in recent memory. The land's minor attraction, the Navi River Journey, allows the riders to go deep into the heart of darkness of Pandora's jungle interior. This attraction features perhaps the most advanced audio animatronic of the 21st century, the Shaman of Songs. As noted by Van Gennecken, the native Na'vi of Avatar are, quote, assigned to the primary color cyan blue in order to stay away from this real-life race heritage, but still within the same repertoire. Most also have the long black hair of Native Americans, but some also show the fashionable braids of African Americans, end quote. With Pandora, the world of Avatar, 
the Walt Disney Company replaced authentic human indigeneity with the Navi species who are taller, bluer, and more feline than anything human. Pandora's headliner attraction, Avatar Flight of Passage, allows the guests to do what the early explorers did in the Avatar story, to inhabit natives' bodies as avatars, to win the locals over. The story begins at the start of the queue, where guests navigate the natural beauty of Pandora. The first interior section of the queue contains native cave paintings of the Navi and associated banshee creatures which illustrates a unique native knowledge of interacting with nature. Visitors traverse an abandoned industrial site ran by the fictional mining company, the RDA, where the bioluminescent forest has grown over. This section of the queue shows the imperial enemy, those who seek to destroy native Navi life in the name of profit. The final section of the attraction's queue is a science lab run by humans that seek to work with the Navi. Here is a lab-manufactured body of a Navi, an avatar. The following pre-show and safety spiel announces, The way you'll be able to fly is by linking to an avatar that's already on the back of a Necron. Let's see how this works. We establish a link using powerful psionic amplification equipment. A human driver is connected to an avatar, which could be physically hundreds of kilometers away. Human guests embody the other in order to take a sacred rite of passage reserved for the Navi themselves. This ride invites guests not only to observe the other, but to become them. In the land story, travel to Pandora is only possible because of an earthen tourist company, Alpha Centauri Expeditions. Fence post marked ACE help make the theme park infrastructure diegetic. The idea is that this othered alien race is cooperating with human tourists' desires and demands. No longer is it politically correct to do this with indigenous human people, but there still is this Western desire to use people for tourist experiences. Disney's Animal Kingdom replaces real others with fictional alien ones. These fictional people fulfill the desires of tourists both inside and outside of the story. This video is but a brief inquiry into how theme park elements like attractions, animatronics, and story portrays human difference. Further researchers must undergo comprehensive study of whiteness in American and European theme parks. If I had more time, I would have incorporated further arguments about the nature of belly dancing within the American and European theme parks as another continuation from the World's Fair tradition. Furthermore, this video looks exclusively at Western theme parks, and there is much to learn from these tourist destinations within the non-West. This video bridges a continuity between the histories of wax figures and robotics. I sincerely believe that this video's largest contribution is in method. Social Media 2.0 opened up a world of objects to study that are too new to have an established archive. Moreover, the websites that contain this information were not professionalized, and there was not an established method for approaching these sources. The same approach of using digital research methods and traditional historical methods can be useful for the analysis of other categories such as gender, class, and disability. Much like humankind, anthropomorphic animatronics have a large range of diversity, most human and some other. If you made it all the way this far, you are a real G for that one. I really appreciate you watching all hour and 20 minutes of this video. So please subscribe if you made it this far. So you are elite. You are elite for getting the end of this. If you made it to the end of this video, Please leave a comment about your favorite animatronic. That's how I know where the real ones are.